I'm uh, wearing some headphones, which may be an indication of what's coming next. I've been working on um, my media, and this is uh, my joke. Enjoy. Nine out of ten readers whose cats expressed a preference have commented on the quality of what they erroneously think is my new black and white tea towel. One of my friends popped round the other day and caught me drying the dishes. The second thing he said was, Stuart, that tea towel is a read Bobby Daz, but I've never seen one like that before. First thing he said to me was, Why is the drying dishes that puff? <coughs> one needs to know that this town is from Barnes and in terms of that fair town, he's seen something of a new man. Not only does he rarely physically chastise his children, but also allows his wife to vote in local elections. He even admits out to one time having partaken of a vegetarian meal, which he felt was alright, although it did the following it. He did take a couple of days off work because of a bit of gut trouble. But I digress to what? The tea towel is not new, it's just excellent novel. I feel now the time to tell the full story of my excellent tea towel. The story begins in 1973, predating the three day week of the winter discontent. Although I worked on the railway, there were a fair few discontented souls. Despite turning up for, fi for five days in each week, most only actually worked one day a week. The phrase work is the curse of the drinking classes, for these have been coined for the staff in West offices in the 1970s. It all started with a trip to the local butchers. We were a bit strapped for cash, so my mum sent me out to buy a sheep's head. Now in these days, when less than choice cuts of meat are hard to come by and offer either trendy, expensive, or simply unavailable, and BSE and Scrapey have ruled out for the sale for human consumption of nervous tissue, a sheep's head is not even perceived as food. How wrong is that? Anyway, I went to the butcher asking for a sheep's head, to which the hilarious wag replied, What do you want a sheep's head for? Your own head seems to fit you very well. You are such a card. I patiently responded by stating I was not worth the gummage. I only wanted a sheep's head for food and sustenance, not as an alternative adornment to my neck. I then added, Could you leave the eyes in as I want to see me through the week? He then proffered me an ice cream head complete with a full set of peepers, which I paid him one shilling, and then duly took home to my mum. Upon receiving the sheep's head, my mum washed it and then put it in a big bowl and covered it in brine. <coughs> I was a relatively poor family who didn't buy those fancy bottles of made up brine, but made our own just by adding table salt to cold water, and I remained convinced it was just as good as supermarket brine. She left the head to soak in the brine overnight, and then she washed it again, put it in a big pan and covered it in cold water, added a stock given and brought it to the boil, then simmered it for two hours, constantly topping up the water. She then removed the head from the pan and left it to cool. She added diced carrots, sliced onions and a handful of pearl bars and remaining liquor and brought it back to the boil. She then removed the chaps, cheeks, from the sheep's head, cut them into small pieces and added them to the pot. So left the simmer and reduce and within another couple of hours we had a tasty pan of sheep's head broth. Mum then removed the tongue from the sheep, peeled off the outer skin and placed the peeled tongue on a plate and added a weighted plate on top. By the following morning, we had some delicious pressed tongue sandwiches for sandwiches and, sa and salads. Finally, she cracked open the skull and removed the brain, which went into the fridge to chill and was used as a wonderful creamy pate or spread. It may seem strange today, but my memory of sheep's brain uh, is one of the very nicest things I've ever eaten. So, all this was going on, I was watching the telly. Not surprisingly, Bruce Forsyth was on, reprising his act from the first ever TV broadcast in 1936. Although I'm not his biggest fan, it's nice to see him. Does he see him nice? Then I met Dave ran up on our new trim phone and asked for a dozen new competition on BBC Two. They were offering a prize weekend in London and meeting with PLO leader Yasser Arafat for the person who could best complete the phrase What should we do with the National Front? Do da do da. What should we do with the National Front? Dave the Brave, so named because he once went to Leeds by himself, although it later transpired that the epithet was somewhat undeserved as most of his family actually lived in Leeds, knew that I had a more than passing interest in politics, so thought I was the man to give it a go. I pondered the phrase for several hours and discussed it with my mum and dad and eventually came up with the answer. What should we do with the National Front? Do da, do da. What should we do with the National Front? Make them go away. Amazingly, I won. Mainly because the only other entrant was an illiterate lunatic from Cardiff who just sent in a picture of a racing car. When the man from the BBC rang me up, I was quite excited. Partly because of winning the competition and partly because I loved the ring tour of the trim phone. So it was time to go to London. I then remember the sheep's head. 
I sang off I could have the eyes, so she took out the bin, washed them and gave them to me. What do you want to take these eyes from me for? She sang. Because I have read that sheep's eyes are a delicacy on Arabs, and I think Mr. Arafat is an Arab, I replied. I read in a book somewhere, because it was all about weird food like salami, olives, garlic and all such stuff. Anyway, I got on the train and went to London and met Mr. Arafat at the BBC Television Studios, where I just completed a recording to Robin Day. I was so interested in going to meet off in the sheep's eyes as a gift of friendship. You've read that bloody book, haven't you? I was here with the sodding sheep's eyes, but thanks for the gesture, it beats that knobhead last week who brought me an entire castle of pig's eyes. I always think it beats me. I know you're the Israeli Prime Minister, for God's sake. Look, let's go to Savoy Grill and a proper meal. I'm paying. So we dined on Caesar salad and a beef on crouse and a nice bit of blue stilted from the cheese board. Wash down with a credible yet unassuming Bordeaux village and a couple of creme de menthe. We then got talking about the vet's question of Israel and Palestine. I must admit he did seem to have a slightly one side take on the issues. But you know what it's like, when you're too close to something it is hard to see the wood for the trees. My main contribution was to posit the two state theory, and suggested that it would probably begin to see the light in about 40 years. He was unsure but thanked me for my contribution and offered me a gift of appreciation of my efforts. He gave me his kefir, his distinctive hat. I bade him farewell and made my way back home for my wonderful prize. Sadly, as the years went by, I lost the agal, that's the headband, so the kefir became reduced from a symbol of Palestinian nationalism to the rather large yet distinctive tea towel, which upon marriage and subsequent children served me very well, drying a million dishes whilst all the time I was thinking of the day when Palestine would be liberated. Unfortunately, the day years went by, it became more and more worn out, until last year I had a fateful decision to make. Do I throw it out or renovate it? Despite the cost, I got a team of expert cloth renovators to give it a complete retread, and once again it graced my kitchen and started to of drying its second million dishes. So our tea towel is not new, but it is novel. I will always hold a special place in my heart. All of this is true, I know, as I made it up myself.